The speakers are Jeffrey Gettleman, Pankaj Seksaria, and Prerna Singbindra. They will appear in conversation with Amita Baviska. Amita Baviska is a professor of sociology at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi, and she writes on the, on the environment and development in India. Her most recent books are Elite and Every Man, The Cultural Politics of the Indian Middle Classes with Raka Ray, and The First Garden of the Republic, Nature on the President's Estate. Amata will introduce the other speakers, and please join me in giving, me, giving them a very warm welcome. Good morning, and thank you all for coming to hear us speak. Our session is on climate change, and we're here today in Jaipur, but right around now, halfway across the world from us, orange and black monarch butterflies are gathering in Southern California as they gather strength to head north to Canada and the Eastern United States after wintering in Mexico. And try and imagine the flutter of millions of butterfly wings as they prepare themselves for a journey of thousands of miles. Now that journey is much more perilous than ever, thanks to climate change. Once this was an evolutionary mechanism that has been evolving over thousands of years, but it now lies broken because the fundamental mechanism, that's the relationship between temperature and the signals that butterflies get to start migrating northwards has been broken. And these extreme changes in temperature have been brought about by climate change, as have a series of other catastrophes for these monarch butterflies. The fact that the milkweed that they feed upon is disappearing thanks to drought, the fact that extreme weather events like storms can kill thousands of them at one go. And as we think of butterflies on the move, let's also think of all of those people, hundreds and thousands of them, ecological refugees so-called, who've had to move because they've been pushed out by rising temperatures, by drying up pastoral lands, by farms that don't yield as much as they used to, because no one can tell when the rains are going to come. In this sort of world, what can our foremost journalists tell us about climate change in the context of environmental degra degradation that's happening on an even vaster scale? So we have here today three journalists, all three eminent in their respective fields, and I'm going to be posing a series of questions to them in order to help us think more thoroughly about what climate change means in a world that already has a really serious problem with environmental degradation. How does climate change make that connection between cause and, com and, and consequence even more complex than it has been so far? So with me today are, first of all, Pankaj Sekhsarya. Pankaj is not only an environmental journalist whose book Islands in Flux came out recently, He's also a novelist whose book, The Last Wave, is about the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and the effect of the tsunami there. But it's a book that really encapsulates all that's been happening in the islands, uh, both in terms of environmental change, but also the cultural change because of persistent human settlements. Uh, the waves here are not only ecological waves, but they're also uh, the waves of cultural transformation. Uh, Pankaj is not only a very accomplished environmental journalist, he's also a historian of science whose writing on nanotechnology in India is widely recognized and admired for being truly trailblazing. And Pankaj is going to be speaking here, first of all, I think, in his capacity as an authority on island ecologies and island cultures, especially the, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Next to him is Jeffrey Gettleman, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist 
for his writing about famine and war in East Africa. Um, there's a lot to say about, about Jeffrey, but um, the, among the most notable things is the fact that he's reported from Iraq and Afghanistan when they were in the middle of war. And uh, some of his quite astonishing experiences have been um, written in, about in his recent memoir called Love Africa, which I recommend strongly. If there's one book you read in the next six months, do read this one. And um, his audacity is not only about going into extreme war zones and living to tell the tale, but it's also about doing things like climbing Kilimanjaro while wearing, with no gear at all, wearing white athletic socks on his hands. So we will hear more from Jeffrey about extreme environments in the context of climate change now. And finally, Prerna Bindra, who is not only an environmental journalist whose work I've read and admired for a very long time because she writes beautifully and it's superbly researched. And there'll be a panel where her book, The Vanishing, India's Wildlife Crisis, will be discussed later at this festival. But besides her work on habitats and critically endangered species, Prerna has also served on the National Board of Wildlife uh, and on its standing committee. And this is tremendously important work because this is a committee that's headed by the Prime Minister. And it's often been the one committee that stands in the way of disastrous projects and really, really sensitive, environmentally sensitive habitats that are threatened by them. Be it most recently the Kane Betwa uh, river linking project, which would cut through a huge swath of some of the best dry deciduous forests in central India. So Prerna is not only an environmental journalist, but like Pankaj, she's also an activist who's made a huge difference to the ways in which India's environments look today. So I'm really proud and excited to be here with the three of you. So I'm going to ask them questions, they're going to respond, and we're going to have 15 minutes to come back to you with questions and, and answers. So let me get started with the first one, which is about environmental justice. Now, even before we heard of climate change, we knew there was an environmental crisis of all kinds. Look at agriculture, lots and lots of tiny farms, both in East Africa and in India and across the world. Too many people depended on small land holdings trying to make ends meet. Um, if one looks at protected areas, right now one thinks about the way in which so much of conservation, our parks and sanctuaries are actually policed at gunpoint because there are people who want those resources for their survival, for their livelihoods. So is climate change something that distracts us from these more pressing, more persistent and enduring concerns? I mean, as the poet said, or bhi gham hai zamane mein. There are more sorrows in the world. Is climate change is one new sorrow amongst an old, an, a mountain of them? Let's start with Pan Pankaj and then move away. Uh, so, I mean, I'll just kind of first respond on the islands particularly, just quickly. I think one is, I keep getting asked this question as to, okay, climate change is happening, what's the impact on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, for instance? And there really is no answer because one thing is that we know climate change is happening, but we don't really know the full mechanics and the full impact because it's a, in my understanding, it's not a very straightforward thing to a cause and a relationship. Uh, at in, I mean, something happening and you see the consequence is not so straightforward. So one, there's clearly a need for uh, more research and more understanding. You know, the other thing for me, uh, I, it's a big conundrum uh, in the context of particularly island systems and the tectonics of the place and uh, the tsunami that you mentioned in the beginning, in 2004, uh, what we know, uh, what happened in 2004 is the tsunami, but the earthquake that caused the tsunami, which was off the coast of Sumatra, had a huge impact, say, on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, where parts of the Andaman submerged by about 15 feet that morning when the earthquake happened. And there were parts, other parts of the islands, almost like a child's seesaw in a play playground, going up and going down. So you have four feet, five feet of uplift and 15 feet of submergence one morning. And when we talk of climate change in that context, I mean, what is uh, a few inches of rise of sea against such a phenomenal change that, that takes place? So uh, that needs to be sorted out because uh, to be understood in that context. But to, to kind of respond to your 
a question more specifically, Amit. I think it is one thing that we have to be really very worried about, and I'm talking about climate change. On the other hand, uh, and I'm kind of straight away going into the problem with the discourse in climate change, is that it becomes, I think, a very convenient discourse to wish away, and I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing on away, everything else that you mentioned about. So if you have floods in Uttarakhand, it's a climate change problem. If you have drought in Rajasthan, it's a climate change problem. We are completely ignoring all the other things that have helped exasperate, uh, exacerbate uh, that problem. So if there have been floods which have been hugely devastating, climate change would have contributed. But everything else that has happened before that, uh, the blasting and the dam construction and the road construction, has hugely multiplied that problem. And when we go straight into a discourse on climate change, and that's why I say we, we're talking it away, we are, one on the one hand, I think it becomes extremely uh, overwhelming. And the other hand, I can very easily say there's nothing I can do about it because it's this huge phenomenon. But we are actually, I think, uh, setting the stage for a much larger crisis. And that thing has to be, I think, discussed first. I think climate change should come last. And not in any way denying that climate change is a very serious problem. Um, well, first of all, let me say thank you for the very kind introduction uh, and to be up here with you guys who really know your stuff. I have just moved here from East Africa and I covered a lot of, of conflict and war. That was a big part of my job. It's what I wrote about in the book. I found myself getting sucked into these, these you know, huge, terrifying, really depressing stories about civil war and conflict in, in Africa. There's a lot of it. But as I spent more time in the region, I got more interested in environmental issues, and I felt almost a, a guilt that I hadn't been focused on that, that I'd been you know, sort of putting that aside as if it wasn't as important as these big human rights stories that I was writing about. And I realized you know, this is the issue of our times, and as a journalist, we have a responsibility to tackle it. A couple things I wanted to share from Africa is, is one, there's a very cruel irony about the people who suffer from climate change versus their responsibility for it. And I saw this in Africa over and over again. There's millions of people that live just on the edge of survival. In the deserts of Somalia, uh, Sudan, um, in the Central African Republic, there's a whole band across the middle of Africa which is just between pure desert, very arid, and, and livable. And the littlest change in, in temperature will push you know, some of these places into, into, into pure deserts where nobody will be able to survive. And the countries that, the countries that, are, that we're talking about produce almost no pollution. They contribute, if you look at the world's graphs of who's contributing carbon dioxide and responsible for climate change, it's not sub-Saharan Africa. And these people will suffer more than anybody else. And it's, 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 it's about as unfair as it can get. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing that I think is really important is population. And we can't look at these, I mean, climate change is an environmental problem. That's, that's, it, 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 it's connected to all these other environmental problems. And in India, we're seeing those kind of with more urgency than almost anywhere else in the world. Already, my job now is I'm the, the South Asia bureau chief for the New York Times. We just moved here from Africa. And already I've covered stories about pollution, sanitation, waste disposal. It's a huge problem in India. But I don't think we can have discussions about that without talking about population. And I'm not here to preach about family planning or any you know, sort of specific measures. That's not my job as a journalist or an observer. But it's clear, and we see this in Africa, we see this in the rapid urbanization and the problems that Africa is now see, experiencing, is that if you don't get in front of population control, there's gonna be more demand for water, more demand for energy, you know, more problems with waste disposal, more contributors to climate change. And I don't see how, it's like the elephant in the room that nobody's really dealing with, which is how can we talk about the environment and even wildlife 
you know, the spaces for, for these animals is, 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 is being steadily encroached upon because people are, the populations are growing in the areas that used to be in, in Kenya. There's now lions that sometimes escape from this park and roam around suburban Nairobi because that area of Nairobi used to be pure uh, farmland or savanna, and now there's housing tracks there and stores. And so you just can't have the conversation one way about what's happening with the environment without talking about the, the rapid increase in a human population. So, thank you. Thanks, Amita, for that very kind introduction and good to hear points. Um, so first, on climate change, we cannot deny it. It's a huge problem. 97% of scientists agree that it's a problem and it's driven by the Anthropocene, by humans. And it's not a problem of the future. We can't say ke ha hoga. We are living it. You have extreme climates. You have uh, extreme weather conditions like tsunami, you have, um, uh, you know, haze um, or uh, sudden drought. You, in, in Delhi, you had one week where you had two degrees and then you had 28 degrees. You have extreme weather conditions when there is rain and hailstorms, even enduring drought in Vidalba, which is costing us in terms of um, uh, uh, economics, in terms of uh, loss of crops, etc., etc. Having said that, that it is a problem that we are living with on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, we just saw the um, uh, storm and cyclone in Kerala, which you know you have lost a number of fishermen. But what are we doing to deal with it? So recently, this week, we had the Devos um, summit in which our Prime Minister Narendra Modi took a leadership position in climate change. He said it is one of the biggest challenge of our times. But what is happening at home? If we are recognizing that problem, it means we should be dealing with it. But the capital of India is one of the most, if not the most polluted, one of the most polluted cities in the world. Yeah, we have 13 of the 20 most polluted cities. And this pollution is impairing our children. Their brain and lung imp uh, development is arrested. And what are we doing to, for that? We have actually, the Ministry of Environment and Forests has allowed for thermal power plants, which is one of the most serious pollutants. So the norms to um, strengthen pollution control have been relaxed over the next five years, simultaneously as we are looking at this pollution. We have <coughs> a ministry, so, you know, forests are the lungs of the planet. That's something we learned as children, that, you know, forests take in carbon and breathe out oxygen. But we are giving out, and India's forests absorb 11% of its greenhouse gases. But we are cutting 250 square kilometer of forests every year. We are diverting it for mines, for industry, for various other uses. That's about the size of Chandigarh, or if you were to put it over the last two years, it's 62 football fields a day of evergreen, prime forests which are going for real estate, walls, mines, plastic industries, whatever. So how, what we are, what are we doing to counter it? So to me, that is very, very critical that, um, you know, that our responses to climate change or we, we are engaging in political double speak. Now, just one minor point you talk about, is it taking away from other problems? Yeah, so, we are sitting in Rajasthan, whose state bird is called the Great Indian Bustard. It is about 300 kilometers from here, near Jaisalmer is where you will find it. We have fewer than 150 alive in the wild in the world. It's a very beautiful bird, uh, huge, handsome. Fewer than 150, Rajasthan has the last viable population. And all its habitat, most of its habitat, has been crisscrossed with wind power and solar energy projects. Entire habitat. And you know, it, for the bustard, it doesn't matter whether it's wind energy, whether it's a uh, real estate project, whatever it is, it's taking away its habitat. It's flying into transmission lines for those wind energy projects, and it's being killed. And we are watching its extinction. So even when we speak renewable energy, even when we seek answers, they need environment scrutiny, they need social scrutiny. 
So, yeah, so there are a lot of issues attached to it. He spoke of the tsunami. The areas which had mangrove cover, the areas on the coast which had mangrove cover saw no death and very little damage. The areas which the mangroves were hacked away ha saw maximum death and damage. So the natural ecosystems which protect us from climate change, we are destroying them. So to me, that's the real issue that we are grappling with. Okay. So, I mean, you've brought up so many issues. So I have the hard job of trying to, you know, winnow them down and try and get a systematic discussion here. So I'll do my best. So one question that's come up, Jeffrey, who's responsible? Because those people in sub-Saharan Africa didn't cause climate change. In fact, it's been suggested that this age, which has now officially been declared the Anthropocene, the fact that we as humans have left our imprint on our planetary boundaries in terms of um, rising temperatures and the increase in, uh, in greenhouse gases, um, should actually be called the Anglocene, because it's been said that you can trace changes in global temperatures to the Industrial Revolution and to the Global North, uh, which has led and primarily benefited from that drive. Some people say you should call it the Capitalocene, because it's not humans in the abstract that have done it, but it's a particular so political and economic institution, namely capitalism, that's responsible. So one question that I'd like you to um, come back to is who do you hold accountable? And how can we actually make sure that it's not abstract entities like global capitalism or white people, but specific institutions and agents that we can hold accountable when we try to think about how to address climate change? That's question one. Um, can I address that as a white person? Sorry? <laughs> can I address that as a white person? Okay, we have, we, we'll make an exception. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. But I, I wanted to hit, I wanted to capture a little bit of your frustration, which is, here is the prime minister of this country, t you know, talking a big game about how important the environment and climate change is, and yet, as you pointed out, and as a visitor here to India, um, and somebody who recently arrived, it's the, the, the level of air pollution is stunning and horrifying and upsetting and causes, you know, stress and anxiety for all of us. And it's mistaken, your predecessor left because of the pollution in New Delhi. <laughs> and, and he did. And, and some people, you know, looked at us as a family and said, why are you guys moving to India? And we said, well, India is a huge, important country and it's, you know, a fascinating place. And a lot of people shake their head and are like, well, it's so polluted, you shouldn't go there. But I did a piece about this um, a couple months ago. And what I found, and this in, in is probably no news to you, is that this government has taken specific steps to undermine environmental protections. It, it, it's not even secretive about that. They have sped up the process to get environmental clearance. And so a, a company that wants to build a, you know, a big power plant or a building used to have to go through certain steps. This government was very eager to eliminate many of those checks and balances. And they were very proud of the fact that this India has risen on this um, Ease of, doing ease of doing business index by the World Bank. And it did, it did, it did a very good job of cutting out some red tape and bureaucracy, but there's a cost and that is the environment. And there's even um, specific rules about how big a building do you need to, to be doing before you hit these environmental rules and they raise that dramatically. So now almost every building in India, you know, falls under those thresholds. So it's much easier to do that. So what I've, what I've noticed is, you know, there's a lot of acknowledgement that pollution is bad um, and that, you know, climate change is an issue that India should play a role in. But I just don't see any, any concrete action uh, taken. And I also see it as uh, a victim of, of the way India is governed with a pretty weak center. And these issues involve different states. You know, the pollution is coming from the Punjab and it's affecting people in New Delhi. And, you know, the, the chief ministers of these two states can't even meet each other. They're, they're tweeting each other, hey, let's meet. No, I don't want to meet. It's the other guy's fault. And an observer watching this is like, w w you know, how can India, how can India aspire to be a global power and they can't get, you know, in front of this issue that we all, everybody in this room feels and, and feels some heartbreak over? which is we're destroying the environment and we're watching it get worse and worse and worse and worse. So I don't want to point fingers about who's to blame, but I do see a, a disconnect. And I also see 
these developing nations in a, in a paradox because they want to grow their economies and they have to grow. I mean, there's like something like, you know, a million people every month in this country that need a job. And so the, the, the government here is eager for investment and for industry. That's their ticket to keeping um, social stability in a way. But, but at the same time, I've, I've, I've researched it. They're, they're knocking out environmental protections left and right. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, knocking out of environmental protections is something that's accelerated in the last few years with the present government. But uh, let me take the unusual position of actually defending the government and saying that, um, you know, these are development emissions. And let us insist on talking about who's responsible for changing climate and who still needs to develop and you know, raise standards of living to some modicum of decency um, that people have so far been denied. So if I were to take the line that the emissions that you see from you know, very old and inefficient coal power plants in India are actually development emissions. They're not luxury emissions from big boat-like gas-guzzling cars in, in North America then um, one may say that, you know, we actually do need to continue polluting for some years yet. But if you had a fairer deal in, and India's emissions per capita are still way lower than other countries, right? So um, the question really is that if we want um, some degree of welfare for, for Indian citizens, for Chinese citizens, for poor people across the global south, um, that people should have more protein in their diet, more, more meat, which means more livestock, which means you know, possibly much more land degradation and so on. If it means growing crops in ways that require more water, more, more chemical um, fossil fuel based fertilizers, how are we actually going to, to do that? What, what are our priorities? And I think that question of priorities has definitely changed, as you said, Pankaj, when climate change has come into the picture. Because earlier our focus was on environmental justice, uh, injustice at the local level, at the regional level, like Prerna you said, in, in Rajasthan, nationally. But now the conversation has really shifted to international injustices, hasn't it? So how do you see that uh, had changing? I mean, maybe Pankaj, you could, you could answer. I think you've really put the finger on the, on the point very, very precisely, and that really is at the heart of the conundrum. And I don't think there are easy answers to that. But, uh, you know, at, at, so I think it's, at one level you're also saying it's a question of equity, right? Who, who gets to pollute and at, at what rate and how much? But is it really sustainable in the long term? Now, in the short term, yes, we might argue for a certain kind of development and welfare. And, but if I was to turn around the question of equity, see, because I remember in, in some conference somebody Put it very beautifully, they said that resource extraction and the disposal of waste goes to that space with minimum resistance. So it is from a certain space that we are, we are extracting resources and it's a, it's a common climate say into which we are emitting our... So if, and I think it goes to a much more fundamental question of what is growth, what is development, what is welfare? Because we have a certain norm and a certain idea of what development should be. So if it means that we have to become like somebody else, can it not be the other way around as well? So if the aspiration is to consume more and achieve welfare in that way, in a long term, I think we are going to be all suffering. Is it not possible to turn the question and say, those who are consuming more or who waste more, is there not a system or a possibility of reducing that kind of consumption? Because you know, the question of the population, I think, is, is a very valid one. But we are missing out on the point of what Amita said is of who is consuming and who is polluting how much. An urban Indian is perhaps as polluting and as much of a problem for the climate as an average European, which is much more than the communities you spoke about in sub-Saharan Africa or large parts of India. So what do we mean by growth? What do we mean by development? I think these are fundamental questions that we will have to address because there's no other way we can Otherwise, deal with that problem. That, that's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll address your question, Amrita, but uh, just pick up on two points. Uh, you mentioned uh, 
uh, population and also you mentioned development. So I 100% agree, population is an issue we need to address, but it's an elephant in the room, a political hot potato. Um, and you mentioned, uh, so you very rightly say, you know, um, we need to grow because we have a population which is very poor. When we talk about energy, there are a number of people who don't have electricity. But, you know, our investment is not on the last mile connectivity so that the electricity reaches the poor. Our investment is on thermal power plants, but not on reaching the poor people. So, you know, our investment in that way is, in fact, um, the electricity ministry, the board has said that India does not need any more power plants, thermal power plants. We have access power. It's the distribution that is skewed. And we're still investing in more coal when we know climate change is an issue, when coal is one of the biggest polluters. So that is that, you know, we need to, need to understand these things. Who's responsible? Now, GDP, I think, yes, we need to grow. But what are we talking about? When we talk about development, we measure it by GDP, gross development uh, product, right? Now, how um, does it really mean development for all? We recently have had two very uh, telling um, studies which said one, that 1% of India's population, 1% has 73% of its resources they have access to 73% of road resources. And this, is, this inequality is going, increasing by the day. But that is not reflected in the GDP. The GDP also measures if there is an air crash, it's a positive, GDP rises, because you, know, you need health insurance, people die, he, um, life insurance kicks on, you need, so, it's a, an air crash is a positive for GDP. A standing forest has no value, but when it falls, it has timber, and when you ravage it, it's mining. So it's a positive for GDP. So is that the index we are talking of? Is it bringing welfare and development to, is it inclusive, not just of all people, especially the marginalized, the poor, but also across species? Obviously, they are not considered any stakeholders. So, I mean, I would bring it, you know, to the opposite side that are we really addressing the uh, social equity development? One last point, the other study that I spoke about said that India is one of the worst performing environmentally. We are just above Bangladesh. Pakistan's better, Nepal's better, every country's better. We are three from the bottom or four from the bottom. So, and environment degradation affects the poor the most because they directly depend on these resources. How do we address environment pollution? We buy air purifiers. We go to Khan market and buy Vogue masks. What do the poor do? That's not the way. So I would put the blame on each one of us. Do we put pressure on the government that you have to address air pollution? Construction industry is one of the biggest polluters. And the government has, as Jeffrey pointed out, eased norms in construction industry. So which one of us is putting pressure on the government? Governments are not going to act unless the voters show that they care. Air purifiers is not an answer. No, I th <clears throat> just, to, just to second that, I think um, one term I learned when I was writing about this was the elite buyout. And that this is, the, and I was kind of stunned. I was like, why aren't more people marching in the streets of, of, of New Delhi and demanding something be done about the air quality because the evidence is there. It, you know, as you said, it hurts the development of children, it decreases lifespan. Um, and I think it, it's, it's sad that there isn't more of an outcry. Um, and I think a big reason why is because people feel like they can carve out a, 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 a go around by buying a mask or buying an air purifier. But you still are breathing that air. So we know, I think we all agree, that we need to improve human welfare, make sure that you know, there's also enough ways of protecting our biodiversity uh, around the world, but we want to do it without worsening climate change, yeah? which is really tough. Now, suppose, suppose you got to be the Prime Minister of India. What are the three things you would do 
to address this conundrum, this, this toss-up between, this trade-off between development for the very poorest, for those who still go hungry without health and shelter and water, and making sure that we respect other species, that we can respect our planetary boundaries. What would you do if you were in Narendra Modi's chair tomorrow or today? Let's start with you, Pankaj. I, I thought about it because we discussed this question before we, over the last week. You're not supposed to let it <laughs> No, so I, so actually I have, I, have, I, have, I have three quick, I mean, I don't know about the larger question, but because of the environment, I think one, if you've read uh, Prerna's book, I think the answer is evident. She'd be my minister for wildlife. <laughs> yeah? And I, and I throw her to the wolves. And she wouldn't mind that. But I mean, also, you know, how we consider throwing to the wolves, that is interesting thing about how the wolves are problematic. But Prerna would love the wolves, I'm sure. You know, the other thing, more, more seriously, I, I would have a ministry for the small and the slow. But I think this, this idea of growth and development, it's all about the big, it's all about the fast, it's all about more. And Amita, you would be that minister. <laughs> I don't know why, but... So but I think we have, we have to reconsider some of the fundamental ideas of what we mean as development, what we mean as... And I'll just give you a little example from the, the work that you mentioned on infrastructures. So I, I did my PhD in science and technology studies, where the idea uh, of the sociology of science, where the idea of infrastructure, I think, is a very interesting, not just in terms of the physical infrastructure, but infrastructure is something that becomes evident when it breaks down. So if you look at our roads, if you look at our sewage systems, if you look at communications, when it's working, it's all fine. When this mic stops to work, that's when the crowds start to get restless. So when the infrastructure breaks down is when we notice infrastructure. And we are completely forgetting that the planet infrastructure, the rivers, the air, the forests, are under constant threat. And I think in some senses it's now that they're speaking up by breaking down. So one would need a ministry of, of something of that kind and perhaps dissolve the ministry of infrastructure and, and something of that kind, which is about building roads and building power plants and stuff like that, which really are the root of the problem. And third would be, I mean, uh, somebody to show India a face that we are not a minister from, from another country, for instance, who becomes a, a face and a reflection to this thing about this great growth, this, this potential superpower. I think we need a lot more humility in this country. We need to look at what we are and somebody, maybe like Jeffrey, to show us that, uh, I mean, yeah, it might be a great civilization and we have great things going on with us, but I think there's serious problems which we are trying to push under the carpet. The issues of equity, the issues of, uh, the degradation of the environment creates refugees. I mean, it's, it's not just about creating more jobs. We are destroying jobs and livelihoods when the environment is kind of destroyed. So that's my really well thought out answer, I think. Thank you. Thanks. My turn. Um, I would make it easier getting a visa. <laughs> to, to get a visa as an outsider, it's like applying to college. I mean, you have to bring in this stack of documents, and there are actually some people at this festival that weren't able to come. Um, so that's what I would do. Uh, as far as environment, I, I th what I've observed is, is Modi is a huge figure in people's imagination, and I think the criticism is he could, he could do more with that. So when the pollution was really bad in Delhi, he was silent. You know, he usually communicates by tweets and, and he said nothing like in those weeks in October, November where it was, you know, the AQI level was 500, 600, like really bad, the worst in the world. And there was this silence from the prime minister's office. And it's not for me to, 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 to be a critic of him, but I'm just voicing the criticism that I collected and a lot of people said, you know, well, why doesn't he ride his bike to work that day? Or tell people there are little things we all can do to cut down on our energy consumption. You know, turn off the lights, share a car, take the metro. Um, another policy this government did is they raised the prices of the, of the metro. The center pushed to raise the prices of the metro at a time when the pollution is getting really bad. And a lot of people are like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. More people are now going to go back to the rickshaws and the buses. And that the metro is like the most efficient way to move people around. Um, so I think there's a lot one can do, even in this government system, of just using the bully pulpit. 
that's a big role of the prime minister is just to, and and to sh to get ahead of this to show that this is going to be a problem for years to come. If you look at all the information about air pollution, it is getting worse every year. It's moving in one direction, sadly. So you just want to start to to grapple with that. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. I somehow thought we would be skipping this one. And uh, I don't uh, never imagined that I would be in the prime minister's chair. And I don't think the current prime minister will appreciate this, but nonetheless. Um, you know, the current government um, rests a lot on nationalism. They, play, they, they are very high on nationalism, on symbols of nationalism. I mean, that's been throughout, but there's more emphasis on that. Now, and as an environmentalist, I've been told because, let's say I prefer tigers to a wider road, whereas I say, no, you need, this forest is important. We cannot have an eight-lane highway cutting through it. Or you don't want a mine which is in an elephant or coal which is in an elephant habitat or where people's fertile fields are. You're called anti-national because you're coming in the way of what is defined as development. But isn't environment a clean air, clean water, uh, national? Isn't it being patriotic to have um, a clean environment, good hygiene? Uh, the I mean, as I mean, I would I would think I would want this government to rethink, or as a prime minister, that you know, all we are the one culture which is something to be so proud of, which is so closely linked to nature, right? We worship tigers as Durga Mahini. The elephant is ga worshipped as Ganesha. Bikaner has a temple where you, rats are the reigning deity. Ganga is sacred. Himalaya is sacred. We bow our heads to the people tree. Then how is it that we destroy them? How is it that the Ganga is one of the most polluted rivers in the world? So I think as it's, I would, I would feel that, you know, it should be part of our patriotism. You know, it's eco patriot because we, our, our nature, our culture, I'm sorry, our culture and our nature as people, as Indians, is rooted in ecology. It's so intrinsic to us. And if you go again to untouched hamlets and you know, remote villages, if all of us have been to, you'll see how still closely they are linked to that. And I would rekindle that. You know, I mean, what has stood India in great stead, you know, most countries, most continents have lost their wildlife. America has lost most of its predators. A few remain the mountain lion. Europe has lost almost all of them. They're all wiped out. But India still has them with our population. 1.3 billion and counting. And, in, and the highest number of predators in the world. We have lions, we have tigers, we have leopards, we have snow leopards, we have huge creatures like elephants, bears. So I think that's why, because of our culture and because of the environment laws, which are being weakened, as Jeffrey pointed out. And I would lay a lot of emphasis on strengthening both these, rekindling our, our ancient, you know, our, our uh, reverence for nature and strengthening, not weakening our environment and wildlife laws. The second thing I just want to flag before I finish this off is we have spoken, I mean, Jeffrey has been on the front line on war, uh, you know, reporting on war, and he knows what a dangerous profession that is. I would like to flag that environmentalists and environment journalists are also under severe threat. We have lost in the past year um, 100 environmentalists every, um, I think we are losing about 100 environmentalists every year. We have lost rangers and foresters who protect our tigers and elephants. I've just got news that one forest guard was found hanging from a tree. His body was found hanging from a tree because he was protecting against illegal cutting of wood. And this is news I get every day. Environment reporting, because you are reporting on resources which are wanted by big business, wanted by the state, are being, so the Pulitzer Institute has called it the new front line of war reporting. It's called environment reporting as a new front line of war reporting. And I think that's something we need to understand, that protecting environment is in everyone's interests. It's, it's our natural heritage, which is our, we are 
keeping for our children, so to speak. And all of us need to be, you know, involved in that. I don't know if that answers if I was a prime minister, but... Yeah. Amita, yeah. I, I, I actually yeah. want to, you know, add something to what you said, because I think these are all tremendously urgent and important issues to touch. But I notice people clapping, and I notice what they're clapping for. So, Jeffrey, you mentioned air pollution. I think everybody here feels a connection about air pollution, because Indians and people from ab abroad who happen to be here, regardless of their background, whether they're male or female, rich, poor, etc., experience air pollution. So the, it's a link that cuts across all these differences. Um, Prerna, you touched upon a very, very commonly held set of beliefs around reverence for nature, for the sheer majesty, the sublime beauty of our rivers and our mountains and so on. Everybody in this room can, and in this place can relate to it. But what we often don't bring to these debates about the environment is the underlying injustice that we've inherited, which is to do with access to land, which is to do with access to water and forests. The Forest Rights Act is still pretty much a fiction for most forest dwellers, for most Adivasis. Uh, if one looks at the direction in which land has been changing hands, it's been in favor of corporates, made easier by government laws. And what you just said, Prerna, that uh, the Oxfam report, which says that 73% of, of, of Indian wealth is in the hands of 1% of the population, which I think I pretty much includes people like us. Um, these are very, very thorny issues, which we actually can't clap about. And no prime minister can possibly do anything about them because they're such entrenched economic as well as political inequalities and injustices. But there has to be a will to do them, right? There has to be a will to... So where is that will going to come from? It's going to come from people like us uh, who are ostensibly the enlightened, caring, upper middle classes. It's for us to say that... Wait, um, can I just jump in on one, yeah. one thing? I also do think it has to do with rule of law. And there's, there's a really bad track record of humans and the environment. And, 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 and hoping that altruism will kick in and people will wake up and say, oh my God, I want to save the earth. There's been almost no, no record of that ever happening. Sure. And so you need, you need tough laws. You need to punish polluters. You need to make big businesses pay the price of, of hurting other people's lives. And when that happens, um, change comes. And so you can't, I mean, I would love it in an ideal world if we all cared more about what lies beyond us. But th there's just not a lot of you know, reason to believe that's going to change. Yeah. And so the other thing that can happen is to tighten up is to tighten up the rules and make people really pay a cost. We need to really implement rules, and I, I agree with you yeah. that we have actually probably wonderful environmental legislation on our books, uh, which but is in fact not being implemented. It's being and deliberately being written, ignored right? and loosened uh, by the government. And um, you know, we can all take individual steps, maybe not use plastic bottles for water, maybe try and use public transport, but at the heart of it, the climate crisis requires big responses in terms of scale, and that means making our governments um, responsible. We have about uh, 12 or 13 minutes for questions and answers, so if you have questions, please raise your hands. We won't get to everyone, but I'll try and get to as many and uh, we'll take questions in groups of three. Please keep your questions as brief as possible. Here, the lady here in front, and then uh, the gentleman with the cap over there. Good afternoon, uh, good morning, madam. Uh, as you pointed out that GDP, when it's taken into consideration, uh, doesn't really give out the best results. Uh, it only provides the best economic growth. But as you said, a green GDP, uh, when we take uh, into consideration the green aspect of it, uh, when pr uh, pollution is taken into consideration, we tend to reduce the growth rate. But uh, in recent events, China, uh, Chinese government has taken an initiative uh, way back in 2008, implemented the green GDP. 
but later when it turned out that uh, gene gdp reduced its economic growth to very low level <coughs> it wasn't a good thing so if india were to implement green gdp uh, given the fact uh, our gdp really has three factors uh, longevity uh, and economic growth and one other aspect you need to keep it short please what's uh, your question ma'am what kind of things come into green gdp exactly okay the question was about green gross domestic product and what makes a difference hi um, i want to ask like um, a lot of things are going on in on this debate but when it comes to the basics about how we can contribute as citizens i've seen that although people are quite you know passionate towards this topic but they don't want to contribute anything like take a parents for example he says oh, they teach us okay it's all about um, saving our environment and everything but then you see them loitering especially when we travel in a car they just throw their stuff out on the road so how do we sensitize the people on the basic levels and how as we citizens could start from something so basic okay i am in my area and i can do something about it how should we start okay for those at the back who didn't hear the question is is all this talk about the environment just hot air or are we ready to actually do something about it what can we do to make people behave themselves yeah um my question is uh, more direct and practical uh, in the name of development we see highways getting constructed and then uh, you find that the the highway which passes through city and the suburban areas the entire city seems to just walk up or come up and start living next to the highway so and you mentioned about uh, eco legislation so my question to the panel is that in what way common folks like us can raise our voice and uh, make it heard to the powers that be uh, so that uh, the development which is necessary is not uh, you know spoiled for for uh, for effect yeah okay how do you prevent people from grabbing resources that they shouldn't and with these three questions we'll take another round let me just jump in on one quick subject about china so the the world had the impression that china was the most polluted country until very recently when india unfortunately took its place china has actually done a lot to crack down on its its pollution um again this goes to the rule of law they're very strict and 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 i'm not China is a totally different sense of government. It's you know many people say it's a police state. India has much more individual freedom. So you it's not it's not a perfect comparison. But the Chinese also were more open to taking in outside expertise and technology. They asked for it. And I've interviewed people who said that you know when China was was reaching these these this air apocalypse a few years ago, they went to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, and they said send us your best experts to help us get in front of this. and i asked people in the prime minister's office here in india would you be willing to do that and they said no Th this is an indian problem we don't need any outside help so there's just i i'm still detecting like a bit of resistance to grapple with with the enormity of the problem um just to add to his uh, answer the chinese people have also taken to the streets in china where it's a, more of a police streets so there have been over a lakh protests a year on the issue of air pollution and pesticide poisoning in villages uh, on green gdp um, so there are various such means to measure um, growth and and development which look beyond the gdp many countries have adopted it along with gdp in india an attempt was made in 19 i'm sorry in 2010 2011 to have a green gdp which would move account for environment degradation because the world bank said that india's environment degradation is costing its gdp 5.7% per year so our growth if it's 9% is effectively only 3% if you take in pollution etc etc and what it's costing so there was an attempt the green gdp which would take that into account but you know governments change and priorities change and that was swept under the carpet what we can do i think i'll hand it over to pankaj so that he can also speak but there's a lot see all of us were individuals you don't have to need to take it as a career if you start acting in ways that we spoke about like not using this and empowering yourself write to the editor blog tweet write to your chief minister if, you know those things make a difference if you only you, 
if you make your voice count, you're a voter, right? I mean, all of you are, so. You know, I think the, uh, I, I would want to go a little more fundamental and, and really question certain paradigms that we take for granted. So the rule of law. But what is the law itself that we want to implement? I mean, what if the problem is with the law itself or with limitations in the law? So uh, the whole idea of, uh, the gentleman said, development is necessary. Now, what is that development? What does, does a road necessarily mean development? It's counterintuitive to not have a road in today's times. But large ecologies, large cultures across the globe have been wiped out precisely because of roads. I mean, in the Andaman Islands where I work, in large parts of Amazonia, it's, it's the road that becomes the meta me metaphorical and the literal vector of taking out resources, bringing in disaster. So how are we going to really challenge? Otherwise, I think we are dealing with the symptoms of, of that larger problem. And I think one point to what, what the lady said, I think, uh, and Amita, you said about, of course, larger systemic changes, but I think each one of us can also make that, that difference. And somewhere, I think the normative and the ethical idea of frugality, I think in a world that wants to consume more and more and more, there is that limit that has been set. We may not have, we don't know it, we will reach it at some point of time. So can, can, can at an individual level and systemically, we talk about less, and that's what I said, less and small and slow. I, and that's what I would say as a larger kind of, I may not have the solution, but at least an approach towards that is what we really require. That's what I would feel. As, as Gandhi said, I mean, the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for anyone's greed. The question is, how do we use laws? How do we use our value systems to try and make sure that greed is restrained? And you know, we put a lid on it as much as possible. What can we do collectively to do that in our lives and outside? Well, I see a lot of hands, so I'm going to move. Um, we have only five minutes. At People back, at the back. So there's somebody wearing a bluish dupatta. That's number one. The lady in the, in the black t-shirt right there, that's Amita, the second she's one. Been very and <laughs> you haven't even yeah, this, she's right. been asking since a very long time. Okay, <laughs> you've been uh, here for a long time, so. Yeah, please, hi. Uh, we all know that environment and development cannot go hand in hand. So what is your take on sustainable development? That question is going to take us well beyond we five minutes, so good luck to you answering that. Okay. Next read, question. Read out of collective okay. books, right? Um, thank you. I wanted to ask about the Indian, um, I don't know if Indians have the resistance like we have in the U.S., and when we want our politicians to do something, like I'm in a group in my hometown where we have 5,000 people, and we'll put out a call to action for an environmental regulation that's coming or that we don't like, and our representative in the U.S. Senate will get maybe 30,000 phone calls, and we've been able to change his mind because we have so many people calling and so many people tweeting, and when they won't answer our phone calls, we send faxes because they have to accept the faxes. So we have, you know, a whole kind of across the United States, and this has been very effective with environmental regulations and, and rules, especially with Trump trying to, to pull them back. Thank so you. So I don't know if, if India has that same type of action. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to make a suggestion. In the recent times, we have seen that the Modi government has passed on the baton of social uh, welfare to the Bollywood area. And we have seen many films uh, coming like Toiletic, Prem Katha, and now we are going to see the release of uh, Padman, which is going to uh, supposedly make the people sensitive towards the problem of menstruation and the people more sensible in uh, uh, just making some changes in their lifestyle. So I just wanted to ask you whether it is possible that we can somehow uh, rope in again the Bollywood superstars and make them some movies on environment and all these problems so that the message goes to the last person and also all those people who are spending their time in front of their television sets or they are on Facebook and social media all the time. Because intellectuals, you all are living in silos and your message is not reaching even the educated people because they are not reading all the newspapers or the okay. reports. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you. So the suggestion is we should rope in Shah Rukh Khan and Amitabh Bachchan? Okay. To they, help they us. They have been roped in already. They've all been roped in. Amitabh has been roped in. Shah Rukh has been roped in. But we need more involvement. The message has gone across. We hope. They've all been roped in. Amitabh speaks for the tiger. Shah Rukh Khan speaks for the forest staff. Dia Mirza is hugely involved, personally involved in every which way. So that has been, so one is trying in many ways. There are very few environmentalists, a lot of people. So each one of us has to be an ambassador, not just Shah Rukh Khan. On conservation versus development, environment versus development, the debate is there. There is no versus. You cannot have development unless you have nature. Look around you. Everything is derived from nature. Everything from the glass that in your specs to this, everything is minerals, wood, sand, Computers are made from sand, there's a, you know, everything. So, unless you're, and your resources are finite, so unless we preserve nature, there's not going to be any development. Let me just say something real quick, which is your point about frugality is like such a good point. If we washed our clothes less, like if you, re, you know, if you could wear your clothes a few more times every time you wear them, you use less water, less detergent, you know, everything we do, if we were just a little more frugal about it, would make a big difference. So, I really appreciate that point. I just want to take up the Bollywood point. I think uh, in, in these things, it completely takes over the message. I mean, it becomes a spectacle, but it doesn't serve the purpose. And I think uh, I've had serious problems with, say, the NDTV program of Save the Tigers with you know, Amitabh Bachchan, for example. I, I mean, fundamental problems with the message, with the method. And see, we have to remember also that it is a certain section, a certain elite class, and I don't have anything against because I belong to that. We talk a certain language, we talk a certain idiom, we come from a certain background. We, the realities on the ground where conservation is concerned, where livelihoods are concerned, are a world that we are getting, dis, I mean, you know, increasingly distant from. And I don't think it is possible. Uh, of course, that might be one part of the whole thing, but I think we require a much larger uh, much engagement, much, much more in-depth thinking. I mean, just, just if you have, you know, uh, in, in one of those programs, with, is, is in one of the NTV programs, somebody who's, who's kind of working with one of the superstars says for conservation and go into the forest and shoot all the poachers. I mean, that's the message being going out. Now, what do we know about that poacher? Who is that poacher? If, if he was known, he wouldn't be even allowed. So I think there's a serious problem in thinking that might be the solution. We, we require a much larger, more engaged uh, Kind of we have, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, become a culture that looks too much to celebrities to save the world. I think if there's one message coming out of this session loud and clear, it's that we need to take responsibility. We need to support all the millions of people out there who are involved in social movements to hold on to their land, their forest, their water. And if that means we have to restrain our own access to resources, the privileges that we have enjoyed for so long, we must do it, or we will be forced to do it, and I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Prerna, for a wonderful talk. Thanks, all of you. Thanks again to Jeffrey Gettleman, Pankaj, Sexaria.